Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We're going to go over Chapter 2 for Chem 103. We're talking about the, mes the metric system. I would definitely recommend that you maybe take this lecture in in two parts. It's pretty math heavy. So we're going to first go over the metric system. Then we're going to go over metric metric conversions. Then we're going to go over some other math concepts like percentages, um, density, specific heat, things like that. I would recommend that you watch the part up to um, finishing the metric metric conversions. Then maybe take a break and then watch the rest. You can do it all in one go, but it's kind of a big chapter. So, um, you may want to watch it in pieces, and that's kind of my recommendation. But it's totally up to you. So here we go. Just to give you some background on units and symbols and things like that, um, the English system was used primarily in the British Empire. And we had these other systems being used everywhere else. So in order to get everyone on a universal system, the French organized a committee to do just that. And finally, they designed the metric system. It's really simple. There's a single base unit for each measurement. So most people use that. We in the US, of course, got to be a little bit different. So we use the imperial system for most things. So that's using inches and yards and feet and stuff like that. Um, when you're measuring volume, you're using cups and tablespoons and all that. That's the imperial system. The metric system, which is what everybody else does in the world, is much, much easier. So the base units for the various types of measurements that we talked about in Chapter 1, length, mass, and volume, are the meter, the gram, and the liter. We're also going to add time to this because that's also a quantity that we can measure. And the base unit for that is second. And you'll notice in this table, well, let me change to black, because I like to use black more than red. The symbol is in this last column. So meter is M, gram is G, liter is a capital L, and S stands for second. Okay. So don't forget those symbols. We're going to be using those throughout the course. Originally, the metric unit definitions were physical distances and physical things. So the distance um, from the North Pole to the equator, um, one ten millionth of that was a meter. The kilogram was equal to the mass of a cube of water. Um, you know, so we've kind of moved away from that now. But that's originally what it was. So you won't really need to know all of the history. Just giving you a little bit of background about the metric system. This table, though, will be your best friend. So common prefixes that are used in the metric system are in this table. You have your base unit, meters, grams, liters, second. You add on a prefix, and that changes the value. So if you were to say, I have one kilometer, that means that you have one times 10 to the third meters. So that's a kilo is 1,000 times your base unit. If you were to instead say, you had one millimeter. So there's milli. That would be like saying that you have one times 10 to the minus three meters. So the prefix tells you the relationship to the base unit. Everything below the base units we're talking about something smaller. So if I have one meter and I have a centimeter, centimeter is smaller. Picometer is smaller. If I compare one meter to a kilometer, 
kilometer is bigger. We're going to practice using this table to be able to write things called um, unit equations. In other classes, you may have heard it called equalities or something like that. It's the same thing. So get to know this table. For this course, I won't be asking you anything outside of this box. Mainly because these are the ones that are used in very regular life, um, used oftentimes in chemistry classes and things like that. You're not going to be using super huge amounts of anything when you're in a lab. So we're going to focus more on those. I'll also let you have this table um, for your exam. So you don't have to memorize it, but you do need to know how to use it. So we're talking about the different prefixes and how to add that. We need to know how to add that onto the base unit symbol. So if you have a kilometer, then you put the K in front of the M. You have a milligram, you put the M in front of the G. I want to point out the microliter. This is not an M. That's a mu, okay? It's got a little tail. Let me try drawing that again. Nope, still not looking good. My pen is failing me. Let me draw it bigger so that you can see it a little bit better. So you see that little tail? That's not a regular M. That's micro, and it means 1 times 10 to the minus 6. So don't confuse that with just a regular M for milli. You can also use a U. So UL is the same thing as saying microliter. So I'll be pointing that out throughout the lecture just to Get the point home. Micro and milli are two different things and they're two different symbols. So one advantage of the metric system is that it's a decimal system. So when you're thinking about converting your recipe, let's say, and you have this number of cups and you know this many tablespoons or what have you, you have to do some math and that math changes depending on what unit you're trying to figure out. So if you're trying to go from cups to tablespoons, that's different than going from tablespoons to teaspoons. So there's no clear relationship between them. You just have to know, okay, there's this many tablespoons in a cup, or there's this many teaspoons in a tablespoon. Whereas with the metric system, the prefixes enlarge or reduce the base units, and it's always the same. Always the same. Kilo always means a thousand. Milli always means a thousandth. And that makes life a lot easier. We can write what's called a unit equation to relate two quantities that are equal. So we talked about a kilometer and that's equal to 1,000 meters. That's a unit equation. When you write it with the abbreviations, kilometer, you abbreviate km. So the kilo, that's the k. The m is the meter. You can also say a centimeter is one one thousandth of a meter. The way to write that mathematically would be 0 0.01 meters. You can also say 100 centimeters is equal to one meter. So we're just writing two things that are equal just with different units. We're gonna do a little bit of practice. So it's really handy to have this table. I would recommend actually that you uh, print it out or just save um, save this as an image or something that you can pull up on your laptop because you're going to be using this table quite a bit. 
So let's practice writing some unit equations. Let's go with something small, nano. We'll go with a nanoliter. One nanoliter is equal to, you can look at what it says here, the multiple or the fraction, what it says in scientific notation will tell you what it is in the base unit. So we're talking about one nanoliter. That's equal to one times 10 to the minus nine liters. Remember, that's your base unit. That's your prefix. So if we're taking one nanoliter, we can look at the chart and find what that means in terms of the base unit. Now let's flip it. Let's say that we had one liter and we want to figure out how many nanoliters there are. One liter is much bigger than one nanoliter, okay? So you're going to have to flip the sign. We're going from something that is big to something that is small. When you're going from a bigger unit to a smaller unit, you're going to have a positive exponent. In our first example, we went from something small to something big, and we had a negative exponent. That's how I like to remember it. If you always know, okay, I'm trying to take a small unit and convert it to a bigger unit, it makes more sense that the big unit, you're going to have a smaller number. So think about it as a pizza versus a slice of pizza. If I have one slice of pizza, and pizza is usually cut into eight pieces, that means that I have one eighth of a whole pizza. One slice, that's small. Whole pizza, that's a bigger unit. However, if I had, let's say, two pizzas, and I want to know how many slices that is, that's 16 slices. Mm. Cannot spell this morning, y'all. I don't even know what word that was going to be. Let's try that again. Slices. There we go. If you have two pizzas, that's 16 slices. You're going from something that's big to something that's small. So that number is going to be much bigger. Let's do another example. Let's say that I have one liter and I want to know how many picoliters that is. Pico is 1 times 10 to the 12, okay? 10 to the minus 12. How do we relate that? We're going from something that's big to something that's teeny tiny, small. So that means we're going to have to have a positive exponent. So that's going to be 1 times 10 to the 12 picoliters. We're going to do some more practice with how to write these unit equations um, in the live lecture because this part is really key. If you can't write the unit equation, then you're not going to be able to do any conversions. So I use the big to small, small to big, and figure out which way you're going and what your sign should be. So small to big, I'm going to use a different color just to Try to pound it home a little bit. Small to big, you're going to have a negative exponent. Think about it as going from one slice of pizza 
and converting that to pizzas. One slice is smaller than a whole pizza. So it's going to be a, you're going to have a smaller number, okay? So you need to flip, you need to have a negative exponent if you're going from small to big. If you're going from big to small, well, you're going from pizzas to slices. There's a lot of slices in one pizza. So you're going to have a positive exponent, and you're going to have a big number. Again, we will practice this, so don't worry. We can take those unit equations, and we can write what's called a unit factor. It's just a ratio. So you're taking a unit equation, like 1 meter is equal to 100 centimeters, and you can write two unit factors. You can write, it's pretty much writing it as a fraction, okay? So unit factors are like fraction, and that's how you can remember the difference. Factors and fractions kind of sound similar, so that will help you know when I say you write two unit factors for this unit equation, factor, fraction, okay? One meter is equal to 100 centimeters. You can write one meter over 100 centimeters or 100 centimeters over one meter. It's that simple. You're literally writing a fraction and then flipping it. So let's write a couple of unit factors for, this, for these two unit equations. I would encourage you to try it. So maybe watch this first one and then try the second one then watch the answer. So we have one microliter, see the tail, okay, is equal to one times 10 to the minus six liters. Just to reinforce the unit equations, we're going from something small to something big. So there's a negative exponent here. For our unit factors, we can write 1 microliter over 1 times 10 to the minus 6 liters. And then we can flip it and say 1 times 10 to the minus 6 liters over 1 microliter. So writing the factors is a piece of cake. It's figuring out the unit equation that's the hardest part. So give number two a try, pause this video, and then unpause it, watch the answer. Hopefully you've tried it. We're going to just go over again the unit, fact, the unit equation and the fact that we're going from gram versus, grams to microgram, or see, I said micro. We're going from grams to milligrams, not the same. So that means we're going from something big to something small. The other way that you can write 1,000 is 1 times 10 to the third, and that is a positive exponent. To write our unit factors, we're going to say 1 gram over 1,000 milligrams. Then we flip it. 1,000 milligrams over 1 gram. So that's unit equations and unit factors. We will do more practice with writing both of these in class, so don't worry. Why do we care about unit equations and unit factors? We use those to convert one metric unit to another. You may see it called the unit analysis method, which is what your book calls it, dimensional analysis. Um, when I was coming up through the ranks, we called it the factor label method. Those are all the same thing. It's the same way to say that we are doing, we're looking at the units of a number and we're using different factors to go from one unit to another. That's it. 
If you need a breather, this would be a good time. Pause, take a second, get a sip of water, shake it off. Because we're about to do some math. So I hope you're ready. I'm going to go through a sample problem first. Then we'll go through the method of how to solve it. So I'm going to show you the method. Then we're going to talk about the generic method of how to solve it. What is the mass in grams of a 325 milligram aspirin tablet? The first thing that you're going to want to do is rephrase the question. Now, there's just a question here. There's, it's not a big word problem. But let's kind of distill it out get rid of all the words, and write down what it is that we have to do. We have a 325 milligram tablet, and we want to know what is its mass in grams. So this is the question. Three hundred twenty five milligrams, what is that in grams? Now we have to write a unit equation. We have to relate milligrams and grams. We can say one milligram is equal to one times 10 to the minus third grams. Now there's two unit equations you can write for this. We're gonna go with this one first and then I'll show you the other way. And this unit equation, you need to use your chart to figure out how to write that unit equation. Then you write out your unit factors. Write them both out. The factors are the fractions. One milligram over one times 10 to the minus third grams. And one times 10 to the minus third grams over one milligram. So we took our question. We're trying to figure out we have this many milligrams. How many grams do we have? We wrote out a unit equation that relates milligrams and grams. From that unit equation, we wrote two unit factors. Now we need to decide which one we want to use. We're trying to get rid of milligrams and get to grams. That means that when we do our multiplication, we're going to want milligrams on the bottom so that we can cancel it out. This unit factor has milligrams on the bottom. So that's the one that we want to use. When you set it up, so this is your, then you multiply 325 milligrams. And you're multiplying by 1 times 10 to the minus 3rd grams and dividing by 1 milligram. The milligrams cancel, and you're left with grams for your units. Make sure that when you're doing these problems, when you set up your math, go through the units. If you have color pencils or maybe use a pen and a pencil or something like that to differentiate, it helps you to visually see what your units are going to end up as at the end. So when you put in your calculator, what you're trying to multiply, you're going to put in 325 times 1, then hit that exponent key. So this portion on your calculator is likely the EE button. That's for exponents. So you're going to hit the 1, 
then that EE button, and then you're going to put in negative 3, and then hit enter. And you should get 0.325 grams. So make sure you know how to put a number in scientific notation into your calculator. If you need help with that, let me know. We're going to do more examples, but I just wanted to go through one so that you could see um, how you solve it. So now, I'll show you the other way. Because there are two unit equations that you can write. The other unit equation that you can write is 1,000 milligrams is equal to 1 gram. And remember that 1,000 is 1 times 10 to the third. Again, you get this from the chart. So that chart that I told you you need to be familiar with, that I will give you access to on the exam, you need to use that chart to write a unit equation that relates milligrams and grams. Then you write out your unit factors. One times 10 to the third milligrams over one gram. And one gram over one times 10 to the third milligrams. We still need milligrams on the bottom. So we're going to go with the second unit factor, 1 gram over 1 times 10 to the third milligrams. When we set up our equation, it's going to look kind of similar. You start with what you have, right, the given information, 325 milligrams. Then you draw what they used to call a bridge. I don't know if they even call it that anymore, but this bridges you from one unit to another. We're going to put our one gram over one times 10 to the third milligrams. And then again, make sure your units cancel. We've got milligrams in the top and milligrams in the bottom, so they cancel. And you're left with grams. you're getting the same thing. So only this time, you're putting in your calculator 325 divided by 1,000. And that should give you the same answer. So that's doing a metric metric conversion. You're taking milligrams, trying to make it into grams. Now, we'll talk about the overall method of how to solve these problems. So applying the unit analysis method, which you may have heard dimensional analysis, factor label method, if you took chemistry in high school. All of those things mean the same thing. So the first thing that we did was we rewrote the question. So what unit are we being asked for? What is the given value, right? So these two steps, pretty much rewrite the question. Boil it down. Then you're going to write your unit equation and your unit factors. And you're going to choose the unit factor that you need to get from the given value to what you're trying to get to, so whatever unit that is. Now, you'll see that it says unit factor or unit factors. That's because you can do multiple conversions. So we haven't gotten to that yet, but we will. Rewrite the question, write out your unit equation and the unit factors, 
You choose the one that's most appropriate and set up your problem. Then don't forget that you need to do your unit analysis to make sure that you're going to get the right units at the end. Then do the calculation. And we haven't addressed sig figs yet because in the last problem, we only have one number, one measurement. So we're not going to change the number of sig figs. We've only got one measurement. And the unit factors that we're using, those numbers are exact numbers. So those don't count when we go to look at sig figs. But when we do two metric metric conversions, then we may need to, um, depending on what we're doing, we may need to look at um, sig figs. So we're going to do another example of a metric metric conversion problem. Please pause it and give it a try. So I would say pause it and try to write out what the question is and then check that back. Okay, did I write the right thing? Cool. Then do your unit equation and then check the video so that at least you can get on the right track and see which parts you're struggling with versus just sitting there staring at the paper like, I don't even know. Get each part and see what makes sense and what doesn't. And when we're in class, we'll do more of these. So I'm only going to show you one unit equation, but know that you can write a unit, two different unit equations that mean the same thing. So here's the question. What is the volume in liters of a 65 deciliter blood sample? And for anyone who is um, acquainted with medicine and all, for whatever reason, we use deciliters when we're talking about blood and blood volume. I don't know why. There's probably some history there. So to rewrite our question, 65 deciliters. And we want to know how many liters that is. So pause it and try to figure out what the unit what a unit equation might be. I'm going to go ahead and write unit equation. I'll give you both options, but I'll only work out one. So we can say one deciliter is equal to, and again, use your chart, look up what deci is. Deci is one times 10 to the minus one liters. Or you can say 10 which is equal to 1 times 10 to the 1 deciliters is equal to 1 liter. Let that simmer. So you can always write two different unit equations, but you'll always get to the same answer. So we're going to stick with, um, with the one that I wrote first to solve this problem. If you didn't get that, that's okay. Try to take this unit equation and write two unit factors. So pause it and write those two unit factors. Remember the factors are like fractions. We can write one deciliter over one times 10 to the minus one liter. And we can write one times 10 to the minus one liter over one deciliter. If you want a little extra practice, you can write one. Uh, 
See, Windows trying to get me updated right in the middle of my video. You can write a unit factor for that unit. You can write two unit factors for that other unit um, equation if you want more practice. So like before, we need to figure out which unit factor we need to go from deciliters to liters. We want deciliters on the bottom so that we can cancel it out. So we're going to choose this one here. Now we can set up our math. We've got 60. Oh, black, y'all. Come on. 65 deciliters. That's our given value. Now we're going to put in our unit factor. 1 times 10 to the minus 1 liter over 1 deciliter. We're going to do our unit analysis to make sure that we're going to end up with, with liters at the end. Our deciliters cancel out. The only, only unit left is liters. When you put this into your calculator, I want you to practice doing the scientific notation. So you're going to do 65 times 1, and then you're going to hit that EE button. Again, as a reminder, that times 10 to the is the EE button for your exponent. So 1 times 10 to the minus 1. And you should get 6.5 liters. Again, we will do a lot of practice. I feel like I am a broken record right now. But these problems, doing unit analysis is going to come back once we get to chapter 8, 8 and 9. So if you need to understand it now, one, because you're going to have homework and a quiz and be tested on it eventually, but two, you're going to need to know this concept again when we get to chapter 8 and chapter 9. So please, please, please take the time. Chapter 2 is a very important chapter. If you did not get this as your answer, try it again in your calculator until you do. Figure out what it is that you did wrong. Now we're going to do a two metric metric conversion. A hospital has 125 deciliters of blood plasma. What is the volume in milliliters? We always write the question first. Even though you haven't done the two metric metric conversion problems yet, you can still look at it and write out what the question is. So pause the video and write what the question is that we're trying to answer. We have 125 deciliters of blood plasma. And we're trying to convert that to milliliters. I want you to notice one thing. We have a prefix here and a prefix here. A prefix in what we are given and a prefix in the units that they want the answer in. That means that we cannot just write one unit equation. We have to write two. If you don't see a base unit somewhere, so we're not converting this to liters, we're converting it to milliliters. So we have to go from deciliters to liters and then convert liters to milliliters. So this is like doing two individual metric metric conversions almost, but we can string them together in one calculation. So you're going to have two unit equations and two unit factors by the end of this. So 
So your unit equation number one is going to take deciliters and convert it to liters. And we just did that on the other one. But if you didn't get it, go ahead and pause it and give it a shot again. I'm going to go with one deciliter is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 1 liters. Then we write out our unit factors. We just write it as a fraction. 1 deciliter over 1 times 10 to the minus 1 liters. And then you flip it. Now we have to do the same thing for the second part. So you see these arrows up here? This is my plan, all right? This is the first step, and this is the second step. So if we only use unit equation one, we would be going from deciliters to liters. But the question is asking about milliliters. So for unit equation two, we're going from liters to milliliters. Pause it. Try to write that unit equation. I'm going to do it out a little bit more here just to review how to write that unit equation. So we're going from liters to milliliters. Liters are bigger. So we're going to say that we're going from big to small. When you're going from a bigger unit to a smaller unit, that means that you're going to have a positive exponent. So you say 1 liter is equal to 1 times 10 to the third, which is that number the exponent you get from the chart, so 1 times 10 to the third. Don't pay no mind to what the sign is on the chart if you're doing the big to small, small to big method. You just need to know the number, so the number associated with milli is 3. Okay. So 1 liter is equal to 1 times 10 to the third milliliters. Now we need to write our unit factors, which are like fractions. Pause it, try to write those unit factors. We can have one liter over one times 10 to the third milliliters. And we can have one times 10 to the third milliliters over one liter. Decision time. We've got to figure out which unit factors we want to use. So in this first, with the first part of our problem, we're trying to go from deciliters to liters. So we're trying to cancel out the deciliters. We want deciliters on the bottom. So that's this one. In the second part of our equation, we're going to be going from liters to milliliters. So we want liters on the bottom so we can get rid of it and be left with milliliters. You write it all out. Don't forget your, your given value, okay? So we're starting with 125 deciliters. We're going to plop in our unit factors. Then, don't forget this step. Don't skip over it. Make sure that when you cancel out your units, you're going to end up with what you want at the end. You need to have the unit at the top and at the bottom in order to cancel it out. 
So we see deciliters at the top and at the bottom. We can cancel it out. Let's use purple. We see liters. We can cancel that out. So we're left with milliliters. You go back up to your rephrasing of the question. Is that what we're looking for? Yes. Great. Now you are free to use your calculator. So don't jump to the calculator first. If you do that, you are more likely to get it wrong. Write out your plan or your, you know, your question, how you're going to get there, your unit equations, unit factors, make sure the units that you're ending up with are what you want, then you can bring out your calculator. So this first part of the equation is going to look very similar to what we did last time. 125 times 1 exponent to the negative 1. You'll get a number for that. Now you can string it all along in 1, or you can do two separate um, two separate calculations, whichever you want to do. We're going to take the product of that first one and multiply it by 1 times 10 to the third. Your calculator should tell you this number. But we can do a little bit better than that. We can write that in scientific notation. So take a second and write this as a number in scientific notation. And this will help be a review for chapter, um, for the pre prerequisite science skills chapter. Pause it, write it in scientific notation. Remember that you have to get a number that's at least one and less than 10 times 10 to the, and we figure out the n, so the decimal point is implied here. We moved it one, two, three, four times, and this number is clearly bigger than one, so it's going to be a positive four. Don't forget your units. 1.25 times 10 to the fourth milliliters. Now, go back to your problem and make sure that that makes sense. We're going from deciliters to milliliters. Deciliters are bigger than milliliters. So the number you get for milliliters should be bigger than the number in deciliters that you started with. And when we look at our answer, it is. So don't just trust your calculator. Your calculator will tell you everything you want to hear. It's going to butter you up. Ooh, baby. I'll take you to the restaurant you like. Get all the extra rolls you want because they're free. But seriously, your calculator can lead you astray. You have to use your brain and use the calculator as a tool, not a crutch. Let's do another example. I want you to pause it and try it on your own. Try it. Just read the question. Write out your question, the unit equations, the unit factors, all of that. And make sure that you're keeping track of everything, that it's neat, that it follows some kind of a flow that makes sense. Because when I'm grading your homework, I need to be able to understand where, you know, what you did. And if the answer isn't right, I need to see where you may have gone astray. So when you're doing your chapter check-in for chapter two, you really need to keep everything straight. Show me all of your work. So practice that now with the practice problems in this lecture and with the live lecture, practice writing it all out so that you have a method, it's reliable, and I can read it. Because the more that I can read, the more partial credit you can get if you don't get the answer correct. So there is a reason for my madness. Okay, so hopefully you've paused it, you've given it a try. Now let's do it together. Well, sort of together. 
together in spirit. The mass of the Earth's moon is 7.35 times 10 to the 22nd kilograms. What is the mass expressed in nanograms? The moon is heavy, y'all. So, 735 times 10 to the 22nd kilograms. I can't even imagine that, that mass. And we're trying to figure out what that is in nanograms. Notice we're going from kilograms to nanograms. So we have to do two metric metric conversions. We can't just jump from kilogram to nanogram. We have to go through their shared base unit of grams first. For our first unit equation, we're going to be taking kilograms and relating it to grams. A kilogram is bigger than a gram. So that means that we're going from big to small. So we're going to have a positive exponent. You look at your chart. One kilogram is equal to 1 times 10 to the third grams. Now, I've been doing this for a long time, okay? Not forever, ever. I ain't old like that. I may be old in spirit, but in body, I'm still young and functional. But I've been doing chemistry for a long time. I graduated from high school in 2006. And that was when I had my first chemistry classes. Okay, so prior to 2006, I had chemistry. I've been doing chemistry every year since probably 2004. I think that was my first chemistry class. It's now 2020. I feel old. I feel like I'm aging as I say this. I'm airing myself out. So I've been doing this for 16 years. Ooh, that hit a different way. Don't feel like you need to be on my level in terms of, because I'm not looking at the chart. I just know these prefixes. I've been doing them for a very long time. It's going to take a long time for you to get that comfortable. So don't feel like, oh, man, or how come? You don't even have to look at the chart. Gosh, don't worry about it. I had to look at the chart at first, too. And on a bad day, I might could still forget a prefix, okay? So don't feel bad that you have to go to the chart and double check. That's how you learn. So please, please, please be encouraged by the fact that you can get there. Don't be beating yourself up because you're not there after looking at it for a day, all right? Okay. Back to the math. We have our unit equation to go from kilograms to grams. Kilogram is bigger than a gram, so we're going from big to small, positive exponent. Boom. Unit factors. We got one kilogram over one times 10 to the third grams. And you flip that bad boy on its head. There you go. For our second unit equation, we're going to go from grams to nanograms. Grams are bigger, which means we're going from big to small again. So we're going to have that positive exponent. Use your chart to figure out what it is. One gram is equal to one times 10 to the ninth nanograms. The unit factors are the easy part. Just write the fractions.
now we're going to get all colorful. The first part, we're going from kilograms to grams. So we need to cancel out kilograms and have kilograms on the bottom of the unit factor and grams on the top. That's the second one here. Then we're going from grams to nanograms. We want nanograms on the top and grams on the bottom so that grams will cancel. There. We write out our equation. Don't forget that you need to use the given information. That's what this is all about. We're going to get super colorful, y'all. So we'll write this first unit equation. Then the second unit equation. Then we'll make sure everything cancels. So we're starting with kilograms. We got them on the top and on the bottom. Bye-bye. Then we have grams on the top and on the bottom. Bye. We're left with nanograms. Is that what we want? Yes, we want nanograms. So now you are cleared to use your calculator. Don't touch it until you have gone through all of these steps because I'm telling you, that calculator will lie, boy. It will tell you all types of sweet nothings. Don't let it get to you. Gird your loins. Be prepared. That phrase always made me laugh. Gird your loins. I don't know what that means. So my calculator will tell me what the answer is in scientific notation if it's a really big number. Yours may not. For this big number, it probably will. So you need to know how to read scientific notation from your calculator. So my calculator says this. Yours will probably say something similar. When you write out your answer, don't write E, all right? We're not calculators. Your calculator also doesn't give you units. But that's how you translate that into an actual answer. Then we do our check. Kilograms, much bigger than nanograms. So we should definitely have a really big answer. And we do. 10 to the 62, that's a lot of zeros. I'm glad we don't have to write that out. Here's one more example of the metric, the two metric metric conversions. And then after this, if your brain feels like it might explode, you may want to pause, get some water, shake it off, call a friend, hug your teddy bear. I know you've grown. You still got something in there that you like, mm, this is from when I was five. That's cool. Hold on to it. All right. You have a large graduated cylinder that contains 2.7 liters of water. What is the volume of water in microliters? Please report your answer in scientific notation. Question. We have 2.7 liters and we're trying to go to microliters. Micro, not milli, micro. So here's the question. Is this a two metric metric conversion or is this just a regular old metric conversion? We have a base unit of liters and then we have microliters. So this is just a simple metric, metric conversion. 
on an exam or on a quiz, you're not going to be told you need to use two unit equations to answer this question. You need to use one. You have to read it, distill what you're actually being asked out of the word problem, and then do the question. So this time, we just have to write one unit equation. We're going from liters to microliters. Liters are bigger. We're going big to small. So we've got a positive exponent. When you look at your chart, you can figure out that one liter is the same as one times 10, whoops, 10 to the six, not negative microliters. Our unit factors are going to be one liter over one times 10 to the six microliters and one times 10 to the six microliters over one liter. And we're going from liters to microliters so we need to have liters on the bottom of this unit factor to cancel it out. We're going to go with this one. We set up our problem. Then we make sure that our units are actually going to cancel in the way that we want them to. We get rid of liters. We've got microliters left, so we should be good to go. Now you may touch your calculator. You put in 2.7 times 1 exponent to the 6. You don't really have to even use your calculator for that, but it's good practice. There's your final answer. We said we're going from something that's big to small, so our number should be much bigger than what we started with, and it is. Don't forget to do that mental check. So this is a good place to pause for a minute. We've still got another um, section of talking about conversions to go, but if you need to kind of let it simmer a little bit, that's cool. So if you need to pause it and do something else for a little while, go ahead, because it's going to be a long video, okay? So, compound units. Some measurements have a ratio of units, and the best example is the speed limit, okay? Now, that's not necessarily metric, but it is a compound unit, miles per hour. You see MPH, but what that really means So we normally just use an H for hour, but people are probably used to seeing HR, okay? That's a compound unit. We can also do conversions using the same method to convert miles per hour to, let's say, kilometers per second or something like that. So... A motorcycle is traveling at 105 kilometers per hour. What is the speed in meters per second? Our question, 105 kilometers per hour to some number of meters per second. We're still going to have two unit factors. Or excuse me, two unit equations. We're going to have to convert kilometers to meters. Kilometers are big. Meters are smaller.
we're going to have a positive exponent here. One kilometer is equal to a thousand meters. Our unit factors we're going to have one kilometer over one thousand meters, and then you flip it. There we go. For our second unit equation, we have to go from hours to seconds. That's not on the chart, but we do know how to figure this out. We know that one hour is equal to 60 minutes. And we also know that one minute is equal to 60 seconds. So if we do one hour and then we write a unit factor for this, the 60 minutes over one hour, let me make sure that looks like an actual H. And then we're trying to get seconds in every one minute there are 60 seconds so we can use this to go from hours to seconds remember this Remember this. You will see something like this on the exam, where you have to go from kilometers per hour to meters per second or something like that. But you will need to know how to convert from hours to seconds or seconds to hours. When we set up our problem, we said we're going from kilometers to meters. So that means kilometers need to be on the bottom. 105 kilometers per hour. We're going to first set up how to get rid of these kilometers. Then we're going to take this part and plop it into our equation as well. Now we definitely need to double check and make sure that we're canceling and getting the right thing. So we're getting rid of kilometers and we're left with meters at the top. Uh-oh, we have hours on the bottom and hours on the bottom, that can't cancel. So that means that we need to flip these two unit factors. So it's okay if you make a mistake. That's why you do the unit analysis. So we need to flip these because we have hours on the bottom. So one hour should be at the top, 60 minutes on the bottom, one minute at the top, 60 seconds on the bottom. And now let's see what that looks like. We have hours on the bottom, it cancels with hours on the top. We have minutes on the bottom. And minutes on the top, and that cancels, and we're left with seconds 
in the bottom. And that's what we're looking for, meters per second. That's why it's important to go through and analyze your units first, because you could put all this into the calculator and get a number, but that number won't be right. Now we're ready. You take 105, multiply that by 1,000. Then you divide by 60, divide by 60 again. Your calculator is going to tell you 29.166 repeating. We need to talk about six eggs. I can't give you five six eggs when my problem only has three six eggs. So we need to round. We're going to round this one. The number next to it is a six, so that means it's going to be rounded up. 29.2 meters per second is our final answer. So this is about as complicated as it gets where you're converting two different units to two other units. Know how to do compound unit problem. You will see it. If it troubles you, I am here. Again, if you haven't taken a break yet, this would be a good time to do it because we're moving into other material that's not metric metric conversions or compound unit problems. So these next concepts should be a little bit easier to grasp. Everybody knows what a percent is. You've had grades all your life. Those are percentages. So it expresses the amount of a single quantity compared to an entire sample. So part over the whole is what you're probably used to seeing. And you multiply that by 100%. Same thing. Let's do a quick sample problem. Bronze is an alloy of copper and tin. If a sample of bronze contains 79.2 grams of copper and 10.8 grams of tin, what's the percent of copper in bronze? Our problem solving skills will, again, come in handy. First thing you should do before you start pulling out information is figure out what's the question. We're looking for the percent copper in bronze. Now, instead of writing unit equations, we're going to write out our known information. We know that bronze is equal to copper plus tin. Okay, and we can assign labels. Bronze is the whole, copper is a part, and tin is a part. We can put numbers to this too. 79.2 grams of copper and 10.8 grams of tin. Something else that we know but isn't exactly in the problem. Since we're asked about a percent, we know how to calculate a percent. So the percent copper, specifically, should be the number of grams of copper over the whole amount of bronze times 100%. What we don't know, we don't know the whole. We don't know what 
number of grams of bronze we have. We can figure it out, though. But you see how I set up this problem? I went through and said, what's the question? What do I know? Pulling the information from the problem and from the equations that I know. And then from there, I look at the equation, what piece don't I have? Obviously, we don't know the answer, the percentage of copper, but we also don't know the number of grams of bronze. So it would be very easy to just put in the numbers that you see in the problem and then just put it in your calculator and get an answer. But that would be wrong. How do we figure out the amount of bronze? Well, since bronze is copper plus tin, and we know the amount of copper and tin, we can just add the two. So you do that in your calculator. and that gives you 90 grams. Now remember with sig figs, if you're doing this, they both have the tenths place. So when you add and you wanna report sig figs, if we were doing that, then you'd have to have uh, 90.0 grams. That's just an extra bonus, okay? Now we can figure out the percent of copper. The number of grams of copper we get from the problem, 79.2 grams, over the whole, which is 90.0 grams. We multiply that by 100%. When you do that, you should get 88.0% copper. Remember that we did multiple operations here to get to the answer. So you need to look at your information in the problem and see how many sig figs you should have. Both of those numbers have three sig figs. So you need to have three sig figs in your answer. So add that point zero, and it'll give you three sig figs. We can also use percentages as unit factors. So 25% is 25 over 100. 10% is 10 over 100. So those are fractions, just like the unit factors we were doing before with the metric units. So when you have a rock and it's 4.70% iron, you can write that as a unit factor. That's going to be helpful for doing problems. So let's do this one. The Earth and Moon have a similar composition. Each contains 4.70% iron. What is the mass of iron in a lunar sample that weighs 92 grams? So the question is, how much iron in this 92 gram lunar sample? Lunar is the moon, y'all, okay? What do we know? We know that the Earth and moon each have 4.70% iron, okay? In this moon rock, that's what it is, okay? Lunar sample, that's a nice way of saying it's a moon rock. We can also write this 4.70%. They keep trying to get me to update, y'all. I'm going to do it after the video. Um, my computer can't hear me 
It doesn't know. But it's going to keep bugging me. So we can write 4.70%. This should be iron. In moon rock. And we can write that as a unit factor. So where did I get the 100 grams of lunar sample? Remember that we're doing part over the whole. And the whole is always going to be some kind of 100%. So if it's 4.70 grams, that's out of 100 grams. So just remember that when you're writing this out. We also know that our sample mass is equal to 92 grams. So the question is, how do we go from here to some kind of an equation? We'll call this lunar sample, just to stay consistent. Just like we did before with setting up the unit factors, and then using that to write an equation, we can do that here. We have 92 grams of lunar sample. We can multiply that by our unit factor. And we can do our unit analysis, too. We've got grams of lunar sample in the top and in the bottom. And we're left with grams of iron. And that's what we want. We can go through and do the math. And with this, you got to be careful because there's a number in the top and a number in the bottom. So you have to multiply... 92 times 4.7, and then divide it by 100. So don't forget this 100 down here. Your calculator is going to tell you 4.324. It's not going to tell you units or anything. But we need to know how many sig figs do we need to put and for that, we have to go to our problem. We've got three sig figs in our percentage and two sig figs in our weight, okay? So the mass of this thing is 92 grams. That's two sig figs. So that means that our answer needs to have two sig figs as well. 4.3, and then don't forget your units. It's grams of iron. So that's your final answer. We'll do more of these. You have, you're going to have your, your practice um, for you to do the participation, the chapter check-in, and then we'll do more in the live session as well. So come ready. The next concept we're going to talk about is volume. Let me make sure I didn't skip anything. Okay. So we understand the concept of volume. It's the length times the width times the thickness. You may also see it as height. Okay. All those measurements have to be in the same units in order for you to calculate a volume. So that means if you have a length in centimeters, then your width has to be centimeters. Your thickness has to be centimeters. You can't go centimeters, inches, and feet. Okay? Wrong. It's got to be everything in the same units. A liter is the base unit for volume. And it's defined by a cube that is 10 centimeters on each side. So if you did that math, 
would be 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters. And if you remember from the previous chapter, when we're multiplying, we're multiplying the number and the unit. So that means 1,000 centimeters cubed or cubic centimeters. So don't forget that. And we know that one liter is equal to, and I'll write it as an equation, 1,000 cubic centimeters. We know something else from the chart that we were looking at earlier. We know that one liter is also equal to 1,000 milliliters. This means if you marry these two concepts, 1,000 centimeters cubed is the same as 1,000 milliliters. And you can say one cubic centimeter is equal to one milliliter. The reason why this is important for you to know, we use liters, milliliters, and all that for liquids. Okay, so that's a liquid volume. But if we're talking about a solid, solids take up space too. And that's all volume is. How much space does something take up? You use this to talk about a solid and what its volume is. So when you see cubic centimeters, chances are you're talking about a solid volume. Now, you may see the term cc on a syringe or something like that, but that's medicine. That's kind of a little bit different. It's the same thing. Maybe it's easier to read. I don't know the history there, why you see that on some syringes and on others you see milliliters or microliters. But know that in this class, when you see cubic centimeters or centimeters to the third like this, we're talking about the volume of a solid. So just like with all of these, we can do conversions and we can do um, in, in calculations. So we have an automobile engine that displaces a volume of 498 cubic centimeters in each cil cylinder. What is the displacement of a cylinder in cubic inches? Now, there's something that you need to know here. You need to know the conversion between a centimeter to an inch. That's not something that you can get just any old way. You can look it up online, but if it's in class, I'm going to tell you what that, um, what that conversion is. Because you may have different sig figs or, um, you know, you may see something that gives you five decimal places and then another that gives you, mm, let's say, two. We don't want to do that. So what I'll tell you is that one centimeter is equal to 0 0.394 inches, okay? This is our unit equation. So I will give that to you if there's a problem like this. So you still wanna write out your question. 498 cubic meters to some number of cubic inches. We know our unit equation. Now we have to write some unit factors. And 
And since we're going from cubic meters to cubic inches, we're going to need to have centimeters, or excuse me, we're going from cubic centimeters to cubic inches. I don't think I said that right the first time. So we need to have centimeters on the bottom. But notice, we've got this three here. We don't have any, this is a implied one. So if we use this unit factor, we're not going to convert all the way from cubic centimeters to cubic inches. We actually have to use this unit factor three times. And actually, I'm going to write it in a slightly different way to highlight that. Cubic meters, or cubic centimeters, is centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. So when we use our unit factor, we have to use it three times to get all of those centimeters to inches. So there's our first one. There's our second one. Why'd you do that, PowerPoint? And then our third one. So that also means that we multiplied inch times inch times inch. And that's also going to give us inches cubed. When you're dealing with volume, you have to do this to convert from one unit to the other. When you put this into your calculator, you can say 498 times 0 0.394 cubed, and that will save you a little bit of time. Your calculator will tell you a bunch of numbers, but we need to look at our sig figs in the problem. We've got three sig figs here, so that's what we need. So one, two, three, we're gonna have to round this four. The next digit is a five, so we're gonna round up 30.5, and our units are inches cubed. So this concept of unit equations and unit factors it applies to more than just doing metric metric conversions. Please don't be intimidated or discouraged by this material. It is it's a it's kind of a leap from the prerequisite science skills to chapter 2, okay? A little bit of a leap. But if you can make it through chapter 2, then you'll be all right for the rest of the course. So I told you that you can measure the volume of a solid. You can also measure the volume of a gas because gas is matter too. You can measure the volume. And gas, you can't really see it per se. How do you measure it? You can't, you can't, do anything with it to be able to measure. You can't take a ruler. So what do you do? For an irregular shape, what you can do is use what's called volume displacement. So let's say you have a graduated cylinder and it's filled with water to up to 50 milliliters. You take this irregularly shaped 
solid, let's say you have a piece of green jade, and you put it into the cylinder. Now, your new water level is higher. Now we're at 60.5 milliliters. The water has been displaced, so you're seeing a higher level than you did before you put in the sample. The difference between the volume of these two is going to be the volume of your sample. So if you do 60.5 and you subtract the 50, you get 10.5 milliliters, okay? Remember that milliliters is the same thing as cubic centimeters. So this is the volume of your jade sample. So when you're given this kind of a problem, we're talking about volume, displacement, and all you have to do is identify in the problem what your new water level is and what the original water level is, or whatever liquid that's being used to look at volume displacement. The difference between those two is going to give you the volume of your sample. Now, we haven't addressed gases yet. It's kind of similar, but instead of plunking the gas into a graduated cylinder, what you're going to do is have some kind of, let's say you have some kind of reaction going in this flask, and it's heated. so that all your gas is like, mm, I want to expand and get away. So your gas is flowing from this tube down here into this flask of water. And the gas is exerting pressure on the water. It's pushing down on the water so that it is being pushed up and being displaced into a beaker. So you start with some water in here, you push some of it out. The amount of water that you displace is equal to the volume of the gas. So you won't have to necessarily explain how gas by, you know, gas volume by displacement works. But if I describe this to you, or I give you an image of this, and I give you some numbers associated with it, maybe I'll tell you that there's 100 milliliters of water in here, and that there's 60 milliliters of water in here. You need to know that it's this 60 that tells you the volume of the gas, not the 100. So you need to understand the concept, but you don't have to recreate it or redraw it or anything like that. So that's gas volume by displacement, very similar to what we do with the solids. We're almost there, y'all. We gotta cover density, and then we have another topic after that, and then we'll be done. So this is definitely a longer lecture. Most of them will be kind of long because chapters are long. So bear with me. Take breaks. You may not be able to do this all in one go because normally this will be broken up into at least two face-to-face -face classes if they were an hour and 15 minutes. 
And if it was a three day a week class, it'd be at least three lectures. So don't feel bad if you need to say, Ooh, I like you, Dr. Hefner, but man, I'm tired of your voice. I'm tired of it too. I'm sitting here talking this hour and 40 minutes. And I'm like, ooh, is she going to be quiet yet? Tag, get the frog out of your throat. I know it's morning time, but goodness, did you drink some water? Did you, you need a cough drop? A lozenge? So take a break. Take a break as you need to. Shake it off, do something else, and then come back. I will not be offended, and I won't even know. This is a video. All right. So density. The density of an object is how concentrated its mass is. So you can have the same mass, and we're talking about people. You can have a person that's really, really tall and a person that's kind of short, and they can have the same mass, the same weight, but their density is going to be different. Because if you squash that really tall person that's like six foot five and take all that weight and mush it down into a person that's five foot six, that's different, okay? So concentration of mass, that's density. Density is defined by the mass of the object divided by the volume. So that's what's written right here. Density is expressed in a bunch of different units, but the concept is still the same. So for liquids, it's grams per milliliter because remember, volume for a liquid is milliliters. For solids, we're talking grams per cubic centimeter. When we talked about volume, that's what we said for solids, cubic centimeters. For gases, we're going to use grams per liter. Now, this image down at the bottom is just showing you that you can have one cubic centimeter of all these different um, solids, and this is a liquid, water, but the mass is going to be different depending on what the substance is. So all of these densities are going to be different. The volume is the same, but the mass is different. So your densities are going to be different. This is a, a chart of just densities of common substances. You don't need to know this. You don't need to memorize it. You may need to reference it um, if you're doing mastering chemistry, but that's it. You don't need to memorize this at all. Just know how to read it. Read it. So there's solids, liquids, and gases in that order. And then there's a column that has the density. So you need to know whether or not we're talking about grams per centimeter cubed or grams per milliliter. Other than that, you don't need to worry about this. So we can also cal we can calculate density by doing mass divided by volume. We can also estimate density by comparing the density of one thing to something that we know. So what you need to understand to, to make this work is that a solid object will float on top of a liquid with a higher density. So if we look at this graduated cylinder on the right, we've got our solid number one and our liquid number one. Solid number one is sitting on the interface between liquid one and water. It's sitting on top of the water, which means that it is less dense than water. It's also more dense. than liquid one. So that's what we can say about solid number one, that its density is somewhere between whatever liquid one is and water. Now you think about solid number two. Where is it located? We got water 
and we've got liquid number two. So is solid number two going to be more dense or less dense than water? Think about it. Lock in your answer. Okay. So for solid number two, it's going to be more dense than water. Less dense than liquid two. And then finally, we've got solid number three. It's all the way at the bottom. So that means that it is the most dense because it goes down through everything. So it's more dense than liquid one, water, and liquid two. So if I asked you which solid is the most dense, you would tell me solid number three. If I said which solid or solids are more dense than water, you would tell me solid two and solid three. So make sure that concept makes sense. And we'll do, this is just a concept, but um, we'll do some more practice in class to make sure that you get the concept of density. So without fail, there's gonna be some math. Calculating density. So this is just a simple calculating mass divided by volume. What is the density of a platinum nugget that has a mass of 224.50 grams and a volume of 10.0 centimeters cubed? Recall that density is mass divided by volume. Even though it's a simple problem, we're still gonna use our problem solving method. One, it's good practice, and two, Sometimes you read a problem and you think it's simpler than it really is. So our question is, what's the density of this platinum nugget? What do we know? We know that the mass of the nugget is 224.50 grams. The volume is 10 centimeters cubed. And though this, well, it kind of is part of the problem, but we know even without it being in the problem that density is mass divided by volume. You're not always gonna get that Hey, remember, this is how you calculate it. No. We already know the mass. We already know the volume. So we literally just have to plug it in. Put your mass on top, the volume on the bottom. Oh, not grams. Centimeters cubed. You can do that division in your calculator, or you can know I'm dividing by 10, so that means I'm moving my decimal place one place to the right. No, sorry, not to the right, to the left. To the left, to the left. And our units are going to be centimeters, grams per centimeters cubed. But we're not done yet. That's what our calculator would say. We need to remember six figs. Our mass has five six figs, but our volume only has three six figs. And we only did the one operation, which was division. So for division, remember that you care about the, the number with the fewest significant figures. And that's what you use to report your answer. Now we need to take this and make it three sig figs. We're gonna have to round this four. 
The number next to it is a 5, so we're going to round up. Drop everything else off and add our units. 22.5 grams per centimeter. So that's calculating density. Don't forget about six eggs. We can also use density as a unit factor. Because remember, we're just talking about grams per centimeter cubed or grams per milliliter. So you can put numbers to that and use it for calculation. An automobile battery contains 1,275 milliliters of acid. If the density of battery acid is 1.84 grams per milliliter, how many grams of acid are in an automobile battery? So if you didn't know, um, those batteries are usually lead acid batteries. So there's, hard, um, there's sulfuric acid in there. Sulfuric acid will mess you up. It is a strong acid, so you definitely don't want to be messing around. Don't try to open up no car battery just to play in it and see what it's like. No, no, no. Dangerous stuff, okay? Lead is also kind of toxic, so just don't do it, right? Don't handle that car battery um, without gloves because you can mess yourself up. All right, that's my public service announcement. Stay safe. What is the question? We have some volume of acid, the density we know, how many grams of acid are in an automobile battery? That's the question. The number of grams of acid in that battery. What do we know? 1,275 milliliters of acid, well, that's milliliters, so that's a volume. We have 1.84, let me write this as a, a unit factor style, grams of acid in one milliliter, that's a density. But what we don't know is the mass, right? But we know that mass over volume is equal to density. So we have all the information that we need to solve this problem. If we take our volume and we use our density as a unit factor, one point eight four grams for every one milliliter and then we assess to make sure that we're going to get the right units at the end so we've got milliliters of acid that's our volume that we're starting with and we're canceling out the milliliters of acid in our unit factor leaving us with grams which is what we're looking for you can flip this unit factor. Let's say that the problem was different and it was asking you for the volume, then you would have to flip that unit factor, okay? But in this case, we've already got it all set up. So we're gonna get grams of acid. So all you have to do here is multiply the 1,275 by the density, which is 1.84. There's a one in the bottom, so we don't have to divide by one, all right? That's not gonna change our answer. But if there was a number there, which there could be, then you'd wanna make sure that you actually do that division. 
1275 times 1 1.84 is going to give you 2,346 grams. And it's grams of what? Acid. Now let's double check for sig figs. Here we did multiplication and technically division. So we did multiple um, operations here. So that means we're going to go back to our problem and look at the measurements that we have. So we know that the volume, which is a measured thing, that has four sig figs. But the 1.84 grams per milliliter, is that measured or is it an exact number? Hmm. So here, the density doesn't change. So we're going to call it an exact number. So when we were talking about exact numbers, you said it's something that you can count. But we can expand that a little bit to say it's something that doesn't change. Okay, it, Based on the properties of this acid, it doesn't change. 1.84 grams per milliliter, that's what its density is. So we're going to treat it like an exact number. Now, I may tell you that it's not an exact number, but I'll give you a hint, okay? I'm not going to be mean like that. So if we say that that's an exact number, then we're going to leave our answer as is because it has four sig figs just like the volume. If it weren't, Let's say that we want to convert this to three sig figs. How would we do that? And again, this is just more practice. That means we'd have to round the four. We look to the right of that four. There's a six there, so we round up. Two, three, five, zero grams of acid if we wanted to do three sig figs. So I just wanted to give you that example and remind you about those placeholder zeros, because that's what that zero is. It's a placeholder. It is not significant. We're almost there, y'all. We got to go through temperature, and then we have to go through specific heat. It's a long one, I know. It's almost two hours at this point. If you haven't paused by now, you're a G. If you have, that's all right, you're human. So everybody's familiar with temperature. It measures the average kinetic energy of all the little particles in motion. We'll revisit temperature when we talk about gases in chapter 10. There's three different scales. You've definitely heard of Fahrenheit. If you watch the news, you hear about the weather, you look up the weather on your phone, you get into Fahrenheit if you're in the U.S. You've likely heard of Celsius. That's what everybody else uses. We just got to be special. But you may not have heard of Kelvin. Kelvin is an absolute temperature scale, whereas the other two are relative. Kelvin, when it's zero Kelvin, it means no kinetic energy. Okay. It means that everything is at a standstill. Nothing is moving. Whereas zero degrees Celsius or zero degrees Fahrenheit, that's not, we don't mean that. So here's a little table that shows um, just the reference of when water freezes and when water boils. So at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, water freezes. In Celsius, that's zero degrees Celsius. In Kelvin, that's 273 Kelvin, okay? And there's no degree sign for Kelvin. It is absolute. Water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 100 degrees Celsius, and that's 373 Kelvin. 
So three different temperature scales, three different numbers, but they all mean the same thing. You can convert between these. So there's um, a few equations that you're going to need to know. By the way, for the exam, you're going to have an equation sheet. So don't be like, oh my goodness, how am I going to remember all of these freaking letters? How am I? No. Don't worry about it. You'll get an equation sheet. You'll be able to print it off and use it with the exam. Okay. So the first one converts degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit. The second will take your degrees Fahrenheit and make it degrees Celsius. This third one, we're talking about degrees Celsius to Kelvin. You cannot convert directly from degrees Fahrenheit to Kelvin. You must go from Fahrenheit to Celsius and from Celsius to Kelvin. You cannot do the workaround. You cannot do this. No, does not work. Let's do a quick sample problem. Body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, more or less. What is your body temperature in degrees Kelvin? I'm not going to hold you. Sometimes I forget these, okay? So you're going to have these equations, right? We have the degrees Fahrenheit, and we have to get all the way to Kelvin, which means we have to go from Fahrenheit to Celsius, Celsius to Kelvin. So our first step is going to be using this equation here. Let me use a different color. I'm just going to double check again because my brain hurts. Yes, even I have issues sometimes. So we're starting with 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. We're subtracting 32 from that. Then we're multiplying by this temperature factor. So that's what you want to put into your calculator. The first thing you're going to do is do that subtraction. So 98.6 minus 32. Once you get that number, you're going to multiply it by 100 and divide it by 180. That should give you 37 degrees Celsius. So that's the first part. We went from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Now we have to go from Celsius to Kelvin. And to do that, we take our degrees Celsius and we add 273 to get Kelvin. Our degree Celsius is 37 plus 273, and that should give you 310 Kelvin. Now, if we were doing sig figs, this number as written only has two sig figs, but our temperature has three sig figs. So we've got two options. Add a decimal point or write it in scientific notation. And both of those have three significant figures. Mastering chemistry may have a preference for 
um, scientific notation. The, the homework application that we used to use definitely had a preference for scientific notation. So just take that into account. And if you didn't do that introduction to mastering chemistry, you might want to do it even if it's late because you don't want to get messed up on that. So this is going to be the most difficult. Um, oh, the title is wrong. This is Fahrenheit to Kelvin. See, I'll be slipping sometimes. Okay. So this is going to be the most complicated temperature conversion that you're going to do. Fahrenheit to Kelvin. Everything else is easy. Now we're at the concept of heat, and we're going to talk about specific heat as well. So this is the last kind of big block, and then we're done. Whew, because I need some water. I'm telling you, talking for this long is kind of insane. And I couldn't imagine doing this in class, like during our lecture time. Could you imagine just sitting there for two and a half hours? Oh, my goodness. Okay. So heat, we talked about temperature, and that's kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy of an individual particle. The heat, we're talking about total energy. Okay, so heat, we're talking about the total. Temperature, we're talking about the average energy. So each particle has an average energy of X, whereas the heat is all of the energy in the system. Normally, you use joules or calories to express heat. And joules is the, um, the SI unit or, you know, the official unit, but calories is pretty common, too. And, yes, calories like the food you eat. So that's little c. What we eat, what you see on the nutrition facts, that's a capital C, and that's a 1,000 little c calories. Just throwing in some knowledge for you. So heat versus temperature. This is a concept you're going to need to understand. As we said, the heat is total energy, and temperature is average energy of a particle. So each beaker here is 100 degrees Celsius. Same temperature, but the beaker on the right, which is B, has two times the heat. Why? Because the system is bigger. It's got two times the water. So bigger system, same temperature as a smaller system, you're going to have more heat. Understand that concept. You will have a question like that on your exam. Just letting you know straight up. So let's do a quick practice. Which beaker has more heat? We've got a 200, we've got 250 milliliters of water at 90 degrees Celsius. And then we've got 500 mils of water at 45 degrees Celsius. So in terms of volume, this one is two times the volume and half the temperature. So the answer is it should be equal. Okay? So understand that concept. We've got twice the water but half the temperature. That's the same thing as having half the water but twice the temperature. That's about as evil as that question can get. So I gave it to you in the lecture. So you should not get this one wrong on an exam if you happen to get a very, very, very similar question on exam one. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You feel me? Specific heat, last concept. You may have a question like this on your master in chemistry, and that's why I want to go over specific heat. Um, and do a, a quick sample problem for you so that you get it. So specific heat of a substance is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of substance by
by one degree Celsius. So let's say that you have one gram of water. The amount of heat that it takes to take that water, let's say it's room temperature, maybe it's like 70 degrees, right? Well, that's Fahrenheit. So let's, let's do Celsius, which is the actual definition. So let's say that it's about 21-ish degrees Celsius. That's about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. 21 degrees Celsius, you want to bump it up to 22 degrees Celsius. The amount of heat that you have to put into the water to make that change is the specific heat. Each substance has its own specific heat, how much energy you need to put into that material to make the temperature increase by one degree Celsius. The equation for that we call specific heat C. Okay. Q is your heat in joules. M is mass. And delta T is your change in temperature. And remember that that's in Celsius. That's the delta signal, that triangle. Anybody who's in Greek life, you should know that. Otherwise, I don't know how you cross. But that delta means change. So let's do a problem together. You'll see how to use that equation. And then we'll be done, I promise. So you're performing a reaction in a flask in a water bath. So let's kind of draw that out. Don't laugh at my flask, y'all. So we've got a flask. It's in water, which is the blue squiggles. And let's say that you're sitting it on some type of platform or something. It's not just going to be suspended in midair, okay? So you've got a reaction going on in a water bath. During the course of the reaction, 150 kilojoules of heat moves from the flask to the water bath. What that means is the heat from the reaction is going out into the water, where my red squiggles are heat energy, okay? So it is warming up the water. The initial temperature of the water bath was 27 degrees. The mass of the water bath is 2,450 grams, and the specific heat of water is 4.186 joules per gram degree Celsius. Calculate the final temperature of the water bath. So that sounds kind of intimidating, but it's not. The question is the final temp of the water bath. The things that we know, we know that we have 150 kilojoules of heat. We know that the water is heated because we're taking the heat from the flask and moving it to the water bath. So we know that our answer should be a higher temperature than the initial temperature of the water bath. So that's, even though that's not a number, that's something that we know from the problem. We know that the initial temperature, which I'm going to call TI, is 27 degrees Celsius. The mass of the water, 
which is our N, is 2450 grams. And our specific heat, which is C of water, is 4.186 joules per gram degree Celsius. The other thing we know is the equation. Uh, not, yeah, well, I guess we'll start there. Q over M delta T is equal to C. So that 150 kilojoules, that's our Q. That delta T, we can write that a little bit differently. Delta T is going to be the difference between the final temperature and the initial temperature. And we'll need that in a second. Now we can move on to solving this problem. We have everything except for what this delta T is. So we can fill in everything and solve for delta T. So what we have is 4.186 joules per gram degree Celsius, that's our C, is equal to the amount of heat that we have, 150 kilojoules, divided by our mass in grams, which is 2,450 grams, times our delta T. That's what we're solving for. So the first step in this is to, we have to isolate this delta T, right? So we're going to multiply both sides by the 2,450. In your calculator, you're going to put 4.186 times 2,450. And that's going to be a big number, okay? Then you're going to divide or no, excuse me, let me just, let me write this out, because for me, I am a visual creature. So now, we have this 150 kilojoules on the top that we need to get rid of. So we're going to divide everything by 150. When you do that, your calculator is going to tell you something like 68.3715 is equal to 1 over delta T. We don't want one over, so you can simply take that number, put it in your calculator as one over 68 point blah, 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 okay? So if you do one over 68.3715, that's going to give you what your actual delta T is. The delta T is 0 0.014626, 0 0.014626, okay? That's strictly from your calculator. So that means that if we take this and plug it into our delta T, 0, let me rewrite this a little bit differently, conserve on space. That's our final temperature, which we don't know, minus 27 degrees Celsius. So if you add 27 to both sides, then you get that your final temperature is 27 point zero one four six two six degrees Celsius. 
But do we want all those numbers? No. We need to figure out 6x. We have a mass that has three six figs. We have a temperature that has two six figs. We've got a mass of water, and that's three six figs. The specific heat we're not going to worry about. We're going to call that an exact number. Most often in these problems, you're not going to be looking at your temperature as um, as a measurement. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. It depends on the master and chemistry problem. If they want two significant figures, then the final temperature is going to be 27. If you want three, 27.0. If you want four, 27.01. So clearly, the temperature didn't raise very much here. So this is the type of problem that you may have to do for mastering chemistry. I will give you something like this on an exam, but it won't be super duper complicated, I promise. I want you to be able to use this equation and understand that delta T is equal to the final minus the initial that's it. So chapter two check-in will be due um, September 6th along with Mastering Chemistry homework. So get started now. This is a lot to do. So if you need help, please reach out and let me know. We'll do a live lecture and then hopefully we can settle anything, um, any of the questions that you may have, and get you on your way so that you can do your homework and actually be confident about it. So that's all I have, almost two and a half hours to go over one chapter. Good Lord. Bless your heart. Hope you got through it. If you did, congratulations. If you didn't, you won't hear this part. So I will see you in class. Uh, I'm going to say next week. But you could be watching this next week, so who knows. I'll see you in class sometime. Bye.